Hello, I'm Daryl Abernathy. I currently work at the Food and Drug Administration. However, I've spent an entire career uh, working in the area of the clinical pharmacology of aging, that is, the use and the effects of drugs in older individuals. That's what we'll be talking about today. Uh, the title of this is uh, really the theme of this presentation. That is that there are many therapeutic opportunities in the older patient because of the multiple concurrent disease processes many uh, individuals have. However, uh, that provides many challenges with regard to optimizing the treatment uh, by minimizing adverse drug effects as well. This is data taken from some years ago that's simply noting the concurrent illnesses that older individuals have. Uh, and so let's look at the line on your right indicating individuals greater than 65 years of age. Uh, and you'll see that in this particular population, about half of them had arthritis, about 40% hypertension, and then on down the list. But the point is that older individuals don't have just one illness. They have multiple illnesses. And for those multiple illnesses, in many cases, there are multiple potential therapeutic opportunities. Showing this, these are data taken from the Los Angeles area from some years ago, uh, but th these data could be reproduced today. This is showing that in 12 nursing homes in the Los Angeles area, the number of concurrent medications individuals in the nursing home were taking. And we can see that in the range of five to seven or eight medications it was a typical average number of medications that an individual in any one of these nursing homes was taking suggesting that indeed there are multiple underlying illnesses going on and that they're being attempted to be treated with multiple treatments. These are data taken from some years ago and have been replicated on many occasions. On the x-axis, you can see the number of concurrent medications an individual is taking, and on the y-axis, you can see the incidence of adverse drug effects that were measured. What you can see is that this isn't a linear increase, so that as individuals start taking more than about five concurrent medications, the likelihood of having a bad effect from those medications goes up rather dramatically. We'll keep that number in mind. About five is, uh, is where the really change in the linear curve occurs, and that risk starts to really increase for the older individual. As I say, these data have been replicated in multiple different studies in multiple different countries, and one always comes out with approximately the same data. What we'll be talking about today, then, are the following. First, we'll be talking about cardiovascular pharmacodynamics in older individuals. We'll talk about this in particular because in the cardiovascular system, there are a number of pharmacodynamic measures uh, that can be well measured uh, in relationship to drug, drug exposure, uh, and therefore the data uh, can be presented in a fairly meaningful fashion. Secondly, quite honestly, that's been my own area of research over the past 20-some years. Secondly, we'll talk about the pharmacokinetics of aging. There are actually much more data in this area with regard to pharmacokinetics in older individuals than there are pharmacodynamics. Why? Because drug concentrations are easy to measure and drug effects are oftentimes much more difficult to measure. Does that mean that the pharmacokinetics of aging are more important than the pharmacodynamics or that drug exposure is more important than drug effect? No, I would say quite the converse. However, uh, I want to present the data to you so that you'll have a sense of what's out there in the literature. Thirdly, we'll talk about multimorbidity multi and polypharmacy. Multimorbidity is a term that's widely used in the geriatric medicine community, simply referring to the fact that older individuals have multiple disease processes at any point in time, all of which can be treated with effective medications, or many of which can. An important element, however, would be that for each of these disease indications, for example, congestive heart failure, diabetes, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, there are treatment guidelines for each of the diseases. 
However, there is a growing body of data that says if one exposed the older individual to follow treatment guidelines for each of the diseases they suffer from, one ends up with a really hopeless mess of polypharmacy. That's an issue that's of current interest in the geriatric medicine community and of great importance to geriatric clinical pharmacology. And then to assess uh, the functional effects of polypharmacy, uh, we'll demonstrate for you a particular approach that we have used with some success over the last decade uh, to try to better understand when there are multiple drug exposures, particularly drugs with anticholinergic and sedative effects, uh, their effects on function and functions related to outcomes, such as morbidity and mortality. First, what are the alterations in the cardiovascular system in older individuals? Here are hemodynamic measures that have been uh, replicated across multiple studies. Most of these are summarized uh, data from the Baltimore Longitudinal Study on Aging. This is a longitudinal study that's been going on in Baltimore for about the last 50 years, uh, following people forward in years over time uh, and assessing their cardiovascular function. So these are, are based on longitudinal data, an important uh, aspect that we can discuss in a few minutes. So what are the changes in cardiovascular hemodynamics? A tendency to decreased intravascular volume, clearly increased peripheral vascular resistance in the older individual, a tendency to decreased cardiac output. This has been controversial. Resting cardiac output in, in healthy older populations doesn't appear to be much different than in younger individuals. However, in older populations, exercise in, uh, increases in cardiac output and cardiac output in older individuals with underlying heart disease is clearly decreased as compared to younger individuals. Decreased barrel reflex sensitivity. We'll talk about the consequences of that in a few minutes. Uh, but one could think of when you sit up, the heart rate in an older individual increases less than it does in a younger individual. Increased blood pressure variability, so that we think of blood pressure as simply going up in older individuals, but it varies more in older individuals as well. There's been much written through the years about high renin and low renin hypertensive patients and normotensive patients. The older patient population, for the most, uh, can be considered a low renin activity population. And finally, we'll show you some data that, that shows rather clearly that vascular endothelium uh, uh, production of nitric oxide and vascular endothelial relaxation is impaired in older individuals. Now, what's, what are some data? This is one of the first studies that was done. It was done by Alistair Wood at Vanderbilt in the 1970s uh, that demonstrated the relationship of age and beta adrenergic function. We can see on the y-axis something called isoproteranol sensitivity. So that isoproteranol, a beta-1 agonist drug that increases the heart rate, uh, then uh, is calculated as a function of I-25. What does that mean? It means that when a dose of isoproteranol is given, what is the dose required to increase the heart rate by 25 beats per minute? And then on the x-axis, we can see the age of individuals, and we can see that as individuals get older, the amount of isoproteranol required to increase their heart rate goes up rather dramatically indicating that beta adrenergic function, in this case beta-1 adrenergic function, is impaired as a function of age. This is over and above uh, effects that would be related to hypertension or other illnesses associated with beta adrenergic hyposensitivity. These are some data that demonstrate uh, the same sort of phenomenon except in the opposite direction. These are data that we created a few years ago looking at the relationship of labetalol exposure and change in heart rate. So labetalol, an alpha-beta adrenergic blocker, we can see 
uh, as, as with any beta blocker, decreases heart rate in individuals, and as the concentration of drug goes up, the decrease in heart rate is greater. However, we can see, looking on the left side, that, that in a younger uh, individual, the amount of labetalol required to decrease the heart rate by a substantial amount is much, much less than that required in an older individual. So this indicates then, again, beta adrenergic hypoactivity and an impaired capacity to have beta adrenergic suppression of adrenergic activity. These are data from the same study looking at blood pressure and heart rate in younger and older individuals. We can see that in the top slide, the change in the systolic blood pressure after administration of a given dose of labetalol in older individuals, and in the bottom slide, that seen in younger individuals. So that we can see, as we would expect with an alpha-beta blocking drug, a decrease in blood pressure, and we would expect then that that decrease in blood pressure uh, would be associated with a reflex increase in heart rate. If we look then down uh, at, at, in, in, in older individuals, we can see uh, that indeed there is not such an increase in heart rate. In the younger individuals with a single dose of an alpha-beta blocker, limited change in blood pressure shown in this slide. What this is indicating is that in the older individual, the impaired beta adrenergic function when the older individual is administered a vasodilating or an alpha blocking drug, their capacity to have a reflex heart rate response to protect their blood pressure is blunted. And as we can see looking here at systolic blood pressure, the drop in systolic blood pressure is substantially greater than that seen in younger individuals. This is a depiction of uh, one person's view of what a vascular smooth muscle cell looks like. Please don't be too concerned about all of the arrows and all of the different uh, mechanistic things. What I'd like you to focus on are two things. One, it, uh, these are the calcium channels, the two major types of calcium channels that relate to the movement of extracellular calcium into the intracellular space in vascular smooth muscle cells. And here we can see what are, are termed potential operated calcium channels these are the L-type calcium channels that calcium channel blocking drugs block, blocking the movement of extracellular calcium into the intracellular space, ultimately then blunting vascular smooth muscle constriction. Here are potential operated calcium channels, and you might say, well, what do they relate to? Uh, the alpha adrenergic receptors are potential operated calcium channels, uh, and the major feature of modulating this type of calcium movement from the extracellular space to the intracellular space. So what do we know about aging and the movement of calcium from the extracellular to the intracellular space and how that relates to vascular smooth muscle activity uh, and to other effects uh, in the heart and cardiovascular system? First, let's think for a moment about what the changes, the, the underlying changes in older individuals are uh, in the arterial tree. From an anatomic point of view, there's increased calcium and collagen. This is even in the absence of, of obvious or clinical atherosclerotic disease. There's reduced elasticity and compliance of the arterial tree in older individuals resulting then in increased pulse pressure. That is that the systolic number for the blood pressure is higher in relationship to the diastolic number, which is lower. I'll show you in a moment the consequences of that. We talked about the decreased barrel receptor sensitivity, uh, and this then relates also to arterial uh, effects of medications. Another anatomic change, thickening in the arteriolar tree, so these would be the resistance vessels that are also uh, made into less compliant vessels, resulting in increased peripheral vascular resistance in older individuals. Now these changes occur in what we would call the healthy older individual without obvious evidence of cardiovascular disease, Obviously, in patients with peripheral atherosclerotic disease, many of these changes are enhanced. 
This is data taken from uh, O'Rourke's book looking at the, the effects of decreased vascular compliance. So we can see on the left hand side a depiction of a younger individual and on the right hand side a depiction of an older individual. So here we can see the blood pressure. This is the pulse wave velocity. So if we remember, in the older individual, the tube or the, the arterial tree is, is thickened, it's hardened, and it's less able to relax or be compliant in comparison to the younger individual. So in the younger individual, with a heartbeat, there's a certain speed of the, of the pulse wave as it goes down the aorta. And this is a measure of that speed and then this is looking at the arterial waveform from a younger individual. I'm sure that most of you studied this in physiology many years ago and may have forgotten about it, uh, but it turns out in this particular instance it becomes quite important. So if we remember, this is the systolic phase when the heart is beating, the left ventricle is contracting, and then the diastolic relaxation phase. This arrow then represents what has been called the incisura. However, what it really represents uh, is a maintained arterial pressure during the time that's very, very important for coronary artery filling. So we can see that in the younger individual, this is a maintained feature. Now in the older individual with, with less compliant large vessels, the pulse wave velocity is markedly increased. That means that then as the pulse wave goes down the aorta and then is reflected back, and it's this backward reflection that the incisura uh, represents, uh, that that's, this occurs much earlier, actually during systole. Why is this important? Because again, it's during this part of the uh, cardiac contraction cycle that coronary artery filling uh, is most importantly taken care of. And we can see here in the older individual, the pressure is much less to fill coronary arteries just because of this decreased arterial compliance. Now, what are data that relate to the clinical pharm pharmacology in older individuals and these systems? Verapamil, a L-type calcium channel blocker, is used widely in older individuals for the treatment of hypertension. It's also used for the treatment of, of supraventricular tachycardias. Uh, and here are data from a study that we did some years ago looking at younger, older, and quite older individuals by exposing them to verapamil. So these were normotensive individuals, uh, and this is simply a pharmacokinetic curve. Uh, demonstrating what we'll talk about in a few minutes, but simply that older individuals in this case tend to have a higher exposure after a given dose of a drug like verapamil than do younger individuals. Now this is looking from the same study at heart rate and blood pressure. So here is the change in mean blood pressure in the three groups of individuals. So this would be looking at the maximum decrease in mean blood pressure after an intravenous dose of verapamil in a younger individual, an, an older, and a much older individual. And we can see at least two things. First, that it appears that the decrease in mean blood pressure in the older individuals is more than the younger individuals. And secondly, that the variability from individual to individual is, is greater in the older population than it is in the younger population. Really one of the hallmarks of not only cardiovascular aging, but other aging processes as well. The variability within a population increases as a function of increasing age. Now one would anticipate if barrel reflex function was working the way it should and everything else was intact, that with this greater decrease in blood pressure in older individuals, they should have a greater increase in heart rate, a reflex tachycardia to protect the blood pressure. In the case of verapamil, then there are no, no uh, beta blocking effects with this drug to suppress heart rate. And what do we see? Well, we see quite the opposite, that in younger individuals with a less marked decrease in heart rate, actually a greater reflex tachycardia than in the older or much older individuals. What does this represent? We believe it represents this impairment in beta-1 adrenergic sensitivity, 
that is that the reflex sympathetic outflow occurring with the decrease in heart rate is, is blunted or the effects of it are blunted uh, in the older individuals. Now why the decrease in heart rate in the very, very older individuals here? Um, we believe that's due to the direct sinoatrial node suppressant effect of verapamil. It's worth noting that if one looks in a large study population for verapamil or to a lesser extent diltiazem, both of which do have direct sinoatrial blocking effects, uh, that there's some mild decrease in heart rate, though not marked. I should say in this particular study, we were very fortunate to uh, have been able to recruit the population we were. Uh, for most of the clinical pharmacology of aging data that we're talking about, these are data that are accumulated in individuals that are at the age of 65, sometimes as old as 75. However, in this particular study, we had the good fortune of having a significant population that was over the age of 85. The oldest individual in this particular study was 101, by the way. So what about these heart rate response? Well, we, well, we talked about the decreased heart rate responses, uh, we believe due to uh, an impairment in the capacity to respond to uh, the reflex sympathetic outflow with vasodilation. There may be parasympathetic changes with aging as well related to the changes in barrel reflex and vagal function. However, those are much less well defined. Another possibility has yet to be proven one way or the other is the potential difference in sensitivity of 2-calcium channel blockade uh, in older individuals as compared to younger individuals. Now moving through the cardiovascular tree, this is another individual's view of the relationship between a vascular smooth muscle cell and a vascular endothelial cell. Of course, this is an oversimplified relationship, but it's simply to demonstrate uh, the point that the vascular endothelium uh, is in intimate contact with the vascular smooth muscle uh, and that uh, there are a number of elaborated substances from the vascular endothelium that modulate vascular smooth muscle activity. The most well described one, of course, is nitric oxide. A uh, Nobel Prize was awarded for this discovery some years ago. Uh, and we came to learn that stimulation of the vascular endothelium results in an elaboration of nitric oxide, then through a cascade of events that are cyclic GMP mediated, ultimately resulting in vascular smooth muscle relaxation. What are the effects of aging and other diseases on this process? These are data that we developed some years ago looking at the forearm vascular resistance in older as compared to younger individuals. The data that I want you to look at are the dark blue bars. And this is then infusion of acetylcholine into the brachial artery and then measuring a vascular smooth, a smooth muscle resistance, pardon me, forearm vascular resistance uh, and forearm blood flow. This can be done by a plethysmography technique uh, relatively non-invasively. And why acetylcholine? Well, it's clear that acetylcholine, uh, when there is an intact vascular endothelium, results in vasorelaxation due to acetylcholine-induced stimulation of the endothelial nitric oxide synthase, elaboration of nitric oxide, then moving to the vascular smooth muscle and vasorelaxation. In contrast, when the vascular endothelium is impaired in some fashion, the acetylcholine has a less response, and if the vascular endothelium uh, is completely destroyed, acetylcholine actually has a direct vasoconstricting effect on the uh, vascular smooth muscle. So we can see here in younger individuals the, the dose of acetylcholine required to achieve a 50% maximal response in vasorelaxation as compared to the older individual. And so this indicates that in the older individual an impaired endothelial responsiveness resulting in an impaired vascular smooth muscle relaxation and decrease in vascular tone. Now there are a number of illnesses and exposures that do the same thing. What are they? Hypercholesterolemia would show up the same way. Hypertension, cigarette smoking, 
for women, postmenopausal women as compared to premenopausal women have impaired endothelial responses. Now in this case, these were individuals that were matched as best we could. They were all non-smokers. They were not hypercholesterolemic. They were not hypertensive. So we, did, we matched as best we could and tried to isolate the effect of age uh, beyond the other underlying potential confounding factors. Perhaps in some ways, a more relevant arterial tree would be the coronary vasculature. What is the endothelial function in the coronary arteries of older as compared to younger individuals? And you may say, well, how would you develop those kinds of data? A oh, good question. These are data taken from a study done in Germany some years ago uh, in which individuals who came in with atypical chest pain and referred to a cardiac catheterization laboratory were studied. When they had their cardiac catheterization, if their coronary arteries were seen to be normal, there was no evidence of atherosclerosis, then they were entered into this study. And the study is the following. This is then the administration of acetylcholine until the maximal coronary vasodilation that could be achieved had occurred. And we can see then in younger individuals the coronary blood flow may increase as much as five or six fold with uh, acetylcholine. However, with increasing age in the study population, the response or the, the coronary vasorelaxation occurring with acetylcholine uh, is progressively impaired, suggesting impaired coronary endothelial function in the older population just as in the peripheral vasculature. Now let's shift gears and talk for a few minutes about the pharmacokinetics of aging. As I said before, there are many more data in this area than there are looking at drug effects in older individuals. You've probably seen several slides much more complex than this in other parts of, of uh, these lectures. However, for our purposes, this is sufficiently complex. A drug is administered to a patient, and if we're thinking about pharmacokinetics only, then something happens to that drug. In some cases, it simply goes into the circulation, and then it's cleared from the kidney. The kidney filters it out into the urine, and away it goes. In other cases, it goes through the intestinal wall. Sometimes there's some metabolism of the drug there. It goes through the liver, the so-called first pass after oral, oral drug administration, and to a greater or lesser extent, it's converted into metabolites. In some cases, those are active metabolites having the same or different effects than the drug that was administered. In other, probably more frequent cases, they are inactive metabolites, and eventually these are excreted oftentimes through the kidney sometimes through the gastrointestinal tract. So let's think about the drugs that are metabolized for a moment. They can be broken into two groups. Drugs which undergo degradation with metabolism. These are oftentimes called phase one drug met metabolic pathways and pathways in which drugs undergo uh, synthesis uh, into more complex substances. These are often called phase two pathways. The data we'll look at are exclusively looking at phase one drug biotransformations because it is in this area that we see uh, pharmacokinetic changes in aging. The phase two pathways that have been evaluated in older individuals are little changed with age. First, what drugs are we talking about? Are these drugs that older patients oftentimes receive or not? These are data taken from a drug interaction table that uh, Dr. David Flockhart at the University of Indiana has developed over the years. Uh, and uh, one can simply Google that and come up with the entire table. What I've done is to select a number of drugs that undergo phase one biotransformations by specific cytochrome P450 enzymes. So let's look at some of them. First, in the middle and in slightly larger type, the cytochrome P450 enzyme that metabolizes many drugs, not just in older individuals, but in all individuals. So what drugs are examples of, of drugs that undergo metabolism by this enzyme? Midazolam or Versed. 
So any time that you have conscious sedation for your endoscopy or colonoscopy or whatever, you get this drug. Cyclosporin, a very commonly used immunosuppressive drug. Clarithromycin, a drug very frequently used for upper respiratory and other infections. Amlodipine, a calcium antagonist drug widely used uh, not only in older but in all individuals for the treatment of high blood pressure. So drugs that are commonly used, that's the point I'm trying to make. Now what about other pathways in the uh, phase one pathways of drug biotransformation? We can see in these pathways as well drugs that one frequently sees uh, that, are, that would be used in older individuals. An antidepressant drug, an antipsychotic or a neuroleptic drug, in this case for CYP1A2, for, for cytochrome P452D6, again a drug widely used for congestive heart failure, carvedilol, and you see some drugs showing up not just in one isoenzyme, but this particular antidepressant drug being biotransformed by more than one of these cytochrome P450 enzymes. Other drugs, well, uh, with regard to this cytochrome P450, 2C9, we see warfarin, a drug for which we are always hearing about potential drug-drug interactions, and phenytoin or dilantin, a drug that's still widely used for the treatment of epilepsy. Another uh, drug, uh, and perhaps for, uh, pardon me, another cytochrome P450 pathway, 2C19, probably what we've heard most in the news media and the advertisements and in the medical literature recently would be around the drug clopidogrel, the antiplatelet drug that is used for, for patients uh, to prevent, to prevent uh, postmyocardial infarction clotting uh, and is widely used. In this, uh, for this drug, uh, what's been uh, written widely would be that there is a small proportion of patients that do not have high cytochrome P452C19 activity on the basis of a genetic change so that their, act, their enzyme is not active. And these individuals may actually not have an effect uh, from clopidogrel and its antiplatelet effect due to it not being able to be biotransformed to the active metabolite that's important. And we can see other drugs that are widely used, diazepam or Valium, and again, phenytoin, the widely used anticonvulsant drug. So the point I would like to make with this slide is that older individuals are widely exposed to these kinds of drugs. Now what happens as a function of increasing age when they are exposed to these kinds of drugs? And more typical kinds of data for changes in phase one drug biotransformation in older individuals are shown here. This is like a midazolam or versed. Midazolam is a prototype CYP or cytochrome P453A drug. Uh, and we can see this is looking at younger old, uh, men and women and older men and women that there's some decrease in clearance of drug after administration of midazolam. The number I like to use across CYP3A drugs is that there's perhaps a 20 or 30 percent decrease in drug clearance with advancing age and that is uh, widely variable but approximately right, a reasonable number to think about. Now let's think for a few minutes about drugs that undergo renal excretion. So these are drugs that are administered, and then if you remember that slide demonstrating how drugs go in and out of the body, these would be drugs that go out of the body unchanged by being filtered by the kidneys. And we can see here a number of drugs that we're quite familiar with, things like penicillin, the aminoglycoside uh, drugs, digoxin, some of the, the diuretic drugs, lithium, uh, so a number of widely used drugs and drugs that are widely used in older individuals. With regard to pharmacokinetic changes of aging, really changes in renal function are the most important pharmacokinetic change. That's demonstrated nicely by this equation and relationship. So this is a way to estimate the glomerular filtration rate in an older individual. Many of you are familiar with this particular equation. Uh, but what we want to demonstrate with it is the following. First, a measure of 
creatinine clearance, which as we'll say, uh, uh, mention in a few minutes, is a pretty good measure of drug clearance in older individuals, we can see that age, weight, and serum creatinine are clearly identified here, uh, such that with increasing age, we can see that becomes an important parameter in this equation, and there are a few parameters that change with age that we need to think about. Muscle mass decreases, meaning that for a given glomerular filtration rate in an older individual, serum creatinine is decreased as compared to a younger individual due to decreased muscle mass and the release of creatinine from that decreased muscle mass so that we can see using this relationship or another commonly used relationship, the MDRD equation, which results in approximately the same sorts of findings, one can estimate glomerular filtration rate in older individuals as compared to younger individuals or in a given patient at the bedside. So let's review for a few minutes the pharmacokinetic changes in older individuals. We haven't shown you data for each of these, however, I want to review them uh, so that you'll have an, a bit of an overview. First, with regard to drug absorption. One might think that this is changed in older people. Why? Because we know that gastrointestinal motility changes in older people. We know that the pH of the stomach, the gastric acidity, decreases in older individuals. And so with those sorts of findings, would we expect absorption of some drugs or all drugs to change in aging? And the short answer is we might expect it, but it doesn't happen. Uh, this has been evaluated, again, on several occurrences in, in fairly broad drug and study populations, and there really isn't much change in absorption of drugs as a function of increasing age. Now, with regard to drug distribution, so how does drug distribute into tissues? Well, let's think about uh, the pharmacokinetics in general for a moment, so that within the central compartment, which, is, which could be comprised of where the drug rapidly distributes, where is that? Well, it's certainly in the bloodstream. Uh, in some cases, it's into the brain, uh, de depending on the drug. As we mentioned, there is decreased intravascular volume in older individuals so that drugs which are distributed into uh, this, this space, uh, for the most part, may have a slightly decreased distribution. In the peripheral vasculature, or in the peripheral uh, pharmacokinetic compartment, then we see something a little different. In older individuals that are given weight, uh, their total body mass is made up more of fat and less of muscle. That's not saying they're fat, it's simply saying that's what happens with aging. So that, for example, in a younger male individual, they may have a total body fat of 10 to 15 percent of their normal uh, body weight. In that same older individual, may have a total body fat of 25 percent. For females, uh, in younger individuals, maybe 15 or 20 percent, and in older individuals, probably 25 or 30 percent. So that the body composition has changed, and drugs that then distribute into fat, as one might expect, have a higher distribution volume uh, than drugs which dis uh, th uh, distribute, for the most part, into uh, body water. What about plasma protein binding of drugs? Uh, this has been studied extensively. We can mention for a few minutes why we think that in most circumstances it doesn't make any difference. However, binding to uh, drugs which bind to plasma albumin, the binding is decreased somewhat in older individuals, uh, and this then uh, results at a given drug concentration in an increased free concentration of drugs. Alpha-1 acyglycoprotein, another important drug binding protein, uh, may not be changed in older individuals. And, however, in older individuals with any sort of inflammatory state, which many have, the binding to alpha-1 acyglycoprotein will increase. Now, why did I mention that although these findings are of interest, they may be of little interest except in very selected circumstances? 
The selected circumstances are when a drug is administered as a single dose. For example, when you receive midazolam or Versed for your conscious sedation for your colonoscopy, then if it is bound less to plasma proteins, there's more of that drug available to go into your brain and to cause you to be sedated. However, for medication that's administered chronically, uh, and that might be if we uh, move down the same line, a drug like Valium for anxiety or another drug for sleep, uh, then one is really administering that drug to a steady state concentration and the clearance of the drug will be a function of the drug that is not bound to plasma proteins. Therefore, these changes in binding to plasma proteins will have little effect on the free concentration of the drug in that circumstance. Now, what about the clearance changes with aging? Uh, well, as we mentioned, drugs which undergo kidney or renal elimination have a rather marked decrease as a function of increasing age. And this is uniform across drugs. You'd say, well, some drugs are simply cleared by renal filtration, for example, the aminoglycoside drugs. Other drugs are cleared much more rapidly, with penicillin being a prototype, uh, in which the drug is administered. It's cleared by the kidney, but it's also secreted by the renal tubules so that its clearance is much greater than renal blood flow. Now, it turns out that the elimination of a drug like penicillin is impaired about to the same extent as a drug that is simply filtered, like an aminoglycoside. Why is that? Because it appears that the secretory processes decrease with age just about in parallel with filtration itself. The drugs that undergo these phase one biotransformations, as we mentioned, the CYP3A drugs, uh, a, a large number of them have been studied with respect to age, have decreased clearance. As I say, the number I like to use is 20 to 30 percent decreased. Uh, then other, drug, other uh, drugs which are metabolized via other cytochrome P450 enzymes uh, have either little change or a similar sort of decrease, but not huge decreases. The phase two reactions, and what are they? Well, glucuronidation, sulfation, and acetylation are the major ones. Uh, these reactions are little changed with age. As you have probably learned elsewhere, they're little changed with liver disease and other sorts of processes that we generally think of uh, with regard to changing uh, drug metabolism so that these changes are really the phase one kinds of reactions. Now let's shift gears a second time and talk for a few minutes about the older individual and their exposure to multiple medications. As we've indicated, older individuals have lots of diseases. These are more recent data taken from a Veterans Administration study, and I apologize for the amount of data on the slide, but this is looking for prevalence of disease in, a, in this population as a function of decade of age, 65 to 75, 75 to 85, and greater than 85, uh, and simply to point out that in these populations, perhaps as many as 80% of the people have hypertension. And if we go down the list with arthritis, heart failure, common uh, illnesses for which there are effective treatments, we can see that an older patient population, if they're treated as we would think of as appropriate, will be on multiple medications. To try to address this issue and think through what the consequences of at least some of these exposures are, some years ago we began to think about how you would look at effects of multiple medications in older individuals. It turns out that as individuals get older, probably more important markers of their, uh, their longevity or what their life expectancy is, is their functional capacity, not their specific diseases that they carry. What do I mean by that? Well, in a patient with congestive heart failure, it's probably more important to know what their walking speed is than it is to know what their cardiac output is. And that correlates actually better with their outcomes uh, than do the physiologic measures. One thing we know about many of the medications that are administered, not just to older individuals, is that in addition to the effects that we seek, they also have other side effects or so-called off-target effects 
And one of the very common ones are anticholinergic effects in older individuals. And then many drugs also have sedative effects. So we wanted to focus on anticholinergic and sedative effects of medications that older individuals receive and see if we could understand the relationship of that to functional consequences in older populations. As we mentioned, there's a high burden of illnesses that uh, medications are indicated for in the older population, however, an increased risk of adverse events. Unfortunately, there's not a good evidence base to, to guide uh, in these complex uh, uh, prescribing situations. And so we wanted to develop a model to assess uh, uh, in some fashion risk and benefit for drugs which do have uh, these effects, that is anticholinergic and sedative effects. To do that, we've developed something we call the drug burden index, never mind the equation for those of you who don't, who don't like equations. But it's simply saying that if we think about in some fashion the cumulative exposure to a drug with anticholinergic effects and drugs with sedative effects, and we then put this in the context of a dose-response relationship uh, so that we incorporate the concept that when higher doses is administered, there's likely to be a greater effect. That's in essence what we're trying to capture with the drug burden index. So that the parameters here We've looked at medicines with anticholinergic effects. These are not just medicines that are prescribed for their anticholinergic effects, but many other medications have anticholinergic effects that are not part of why we're prescribing them. The same with drugs with sedative effects. The D stands for daily dose and then the minimum recommended dose. How did we arrive at this? Well. The minimum recommended dose, we simply said, well, when the Food and Drug Administration approves a drug, it has to be demonstrated to be effective. And if it's not effective, that dose won't be approved. So the lowest approved dose is what we are we we're calling the minimum recommended dose. The functional measures that are looked at are the following. Chair stands, a six-minute walk, a narrow six-meter walk, standing balance, and then a, a summation of these uh, findings uh, to make a, a measure of physical function. This has been carefully validated in a number of older patient populations uh, who are at varying levels of function and it appears to be quite reproducible. With regard to sedative effects, a very commonly used measure is something called the digit symbol substitution test. This is from an intelligence test, the Wechsler scale, uh, but it's simply saying that uh, using this kind of a cognitive function test, this is a measure of psychomotor performance and attention. So what are the findings? If we th think about this drug burden index parameter that we talked about, this is looking at anticholinergic drugs or drugs with anticholinergic effects only in a particular longitudinal study population that's been developed by the National Institute on Aging the Health, Aging, and Body Composition Study, Health ABC. So this is looking at the, the function and sedation scores. This is the function score, and this is the sedation score as a function of increased ex increasing exposure to anticholinergic burden. And so we can see that there is an impairment uh, in both of these scores as a function of increased drug exposure. This is looking at sedative effects, and we see approximately the same thing. Now, what does that mean? Because those are simply numbers. Uh, as I say, these, these parameters have been validated in a number of different study populations, uh, and so we've come to understand what a change in score means. So that for the functional score, what's oftentimes called the health ABC score, uh, one point change in drug burden index is equal to about three more physical comorbidities. If you'd say, well, what comorbidities? What we did was to control these data for the variety of concurrent illnesses the individuals have, because obviously an individual with congestive heart failure or an individual with arthritis or an individual with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease will have changes in function that have nothing to do with drug exposure. So those were controlled for, but then turned around 
when, those, when one looks at that a one point change in this functional score, that's equal to about three additional concurrent illnesses. So that was a cross-sectional evaluation with this kind of an evaluation. And so we've looked further to say, well, that's interesting, but what happens over time? If we knew what this, uh, this drug burden index was, was at a point in time, uh, how will that individual be functioning some years down the road? These are longitudinal studies, so we're able to do that sort of evaluation. And so in this particular population, we looked at the drug burden index at one, three, and five years from the onset of the study and the drug burden exposure and then looked at functional performance at year six. So that going into the study, what was their, their uh, drug exposure or their burden index and then what was their performance some years later. And the short answer is it did predict when they came into the study, their drug exposure predicted quite well impairments in function and cognition six years later. So it looks like that this sort of measure is robust, but also that the findings are probably robust. That is that when older individuals are exposed to multiple medications and those that carry with them anticholinergic and or sedative effects, that we must be very cautious uh, and determine that indeed the benefits from the exposure to the medication outweigh the potential risks. Now, how to get information uh, when a drug is being evaluated uh, regarding its effects in an older patient population? You'll read in many publications people decrying uh, the lack of information in older individuals uh, when a drug's approved so that physicians don't really know how to use that medication in an older patient population. And that has to do with the assessment of the medication during the drug development process uh, and the data that are provided to the Food and Drug Administration uh, for the drug approval package. So we believe the reason to include individuals with multiple chronic conditions in clinical trials of medications uh, is that that will be really the only way we'll develop that kind of information. At the present time, the guidelines for, drug, uh, for companies who are developing medications in the United States uh, and in Europe and Japan are constructed in such ways that, that drug sponsors are encouraged to incorporate patient populations in their study uh, population that, that would be the same as the patients who would be likely to receive that drug uh, when the drug is approved. In some cases, that uh, seems to be occurring. In other cases, it would appear that we still have work to do in terms of getting better information about individuals with multiple chronic conditions uh, at, before a drug is approved and uh, after the drug is approved uh, to study that medication to figure out how to best use it therapeutically. So what we've tried to do are, is to review uh, some of the uh, one element of pharmacodynamics of, of aging uh, with regard to cardiovascular pharmacodynamics. We've looked through uh, a brief overview of pharmacokinetic or drug exposure changes with aging. Um, and then we've, we've looked uh, at trying to understand changes in aging that relate to outcomes when uh, older individuals are exposed to medications with anticholinergic and sedative effects. All of this is moving toward the goal, and that is to administer medications to older individuals judiciously, however, in such a way to optimize the therapeutic effects and decrease morbidity and mortality, while avoiding and minimizing drug-related problems and of course to improve this evanescent thing called quality of life. What do we hope to achieve? Well, a negative view would be this by Robert Louis Stevenson many years ago. By the time someone gets old, the, one's existence is a miracle. But a more happy view would be this, and that is the best of things are yet to be. Uh, I prefer the second. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I, I hope that this has been useful uh, to at least raise your interest in this important area of drug exposure and drug effect in older individuals.
This is a very important therapeutic area. If we look not just in the United States or the developing world, but really world, developed world, but really worldwide, aging populations become a very important uh, patient population for which we need to provide good therapeutics. Thank you very much. Thank you.